Here's round two of PE problems. Grab your seat in the auditorium and buckle up because we're doing wood. Yes, if you see here, we have codes and provisions and uh, that are outdated. This problem's a little old. Go with the updated versions, obviously, but I want to make that clear. We are given a dug for number two and we're given all of these adjustment factors, which is really nice. Adjustment factors for wood design, for those who don't know, are the part that takes the most amount of time. It's the tedious part that makes wood design somewhat complicated. Once you find all of those, it's really, really straightforward. Six minutes, we've talked about it before. That's all you have for a problem on average. So they can't keep you number crunching for forever. And a lot of difficult um, adjustment factors take longer than six minutes to find. Like there's some that, are, that just suck. C sub P or yeah, C sub P right here, your stability factor, just like it totally stinks to find. So remember that you shouldn't be doing crazy amounts of work for a wood problem on the PE exam. Use allowable stress design, ASD. All right, so they give us what method to use and we need to find the maximum vertical load in pounds. So star that as well, the units that they're expecting per stud is most nearly what? The first place that I would start is to find the design value for compression for the wood member that I have. Because axial load, vertical load, we have a stud here and we have load acting down on it, vertical load. So that is putting our stud in compression. So we need to find FC for the species of stud that we have, which we were given as a Doug for Larch number two. That means we need to head to the NDS supplement. You're gonna head to table 4A. One thing I wanna point out, there are two tables that look identical. You have the tables for two inch to four inch thick members. And then further down past this, you have tables for five inches and thicker members. So, you know, a six by six column, stuff like that has different design properties than your stud framing. So watch out for that because they look the same. If you're panicked, you might trip up and go to the wrong table by accident. So there are multiple of those tables. Uh, it's in alphabetical order by species name. We are Doug fir. So we're gonna scroll down. You'll notice that there's a bunch of kinds of Doug fir. They were very specific and they should be in the exam. Doug fir larch. And we need to, so these are all uh, design values in stress in pounds per square inch for the different loadings of wood. For compression, there's two different values because you can load wood two different ways. Um, you can load compression perpendicular to grain or parallel to grain. A two by four on its side, it doesn't matter like say it was cut in a portion where the grains do like this kind of thing versus a two by four where the grains were cut, they're more like that kind of thing. It doesn't make a difference. They're all the same. And the loading is just, if there's a two by flat, this is a this is a section if we weren't clear. So this is, you know, the two inch and this is the four inch for our two by four. Actual sizes is one and a half inch by three and a half inches. But your force coming down on it this way is perpendicular to grain and then like in our case, we have force acting parallel down on the lengthwise of our stud. And that means we are uh, force parallel to grain. So we are this guy today. Number two, we're gonna slide all the way over. That gets us 1350 PSI for compression parallel to grain. Next, I would jump over to the NDS and I would go to table 431, as you see here. And make sure you're under chapter four sawn lumber. Each chapter has one of these based on the different um, the types of wood uh, members that you can get. So you have a CLT section, you have um, a wood pole section, you have sawn lumber, you have a glue lamp section. So make sure you check to see what member you're designing and go to the appropriate section because they gave us all the adjustment factors, but I'm not quite sure, well, did they give us every single one or do I need to solve another one? So I'm gonna stop here real fast we know we are um, compression parallel to grain. And we're just gonna double check that we have all of these. So you can pause it right here. And again, we're doing ASD design. So we are encompassing all of these if you're really new to, to wood design. The gray is LRFD only, so that's not us. Boom. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six adjustment factors. Pause the video, make sure you got it go side by side, but I'm gonna head back. One, two, three, four, five. They have two values for C sub P, but that would make six. All right, so they gave us everything. We don't have to solve any adjustment factors. Awesome. 
Well, what about that, uh, CISA P? Why are there two? CISA P is all about how your column is braced. And in this case, our stud is our column. And that's why they give us this figure down here. And they also say the gypsum board provides stud weak axis bracing, X axis, Y axis. If you were to push down on that, um, which way would it, would it bow out first? Just logically, it would bow out this way first. Get rid of that arrow because it's more slender in that direction. Its depth is significantly less than compared to its depth going that way. Um, so in the weak axis, you would theoretically have a much smaller C sub P, but that's not the case. It's larger. Why is it larger? It's because the gypsum board nailed every, you know, 12 inches on center to the stud provides a continuously braced member in the weak axis direction. And that's what this clause is saying. So your C sub P uh, factor just stays 1.0. If it's continuously braced, it's 1.0. Well, now for the strong axis though, there is nothing bracing it for kicking out this way. It's said that our stud is eight feet high. So it's, it's unbraced for a height of eight feet for these project parameters. That gets us a C sub P factor of 0 0.33. So we take a massive hit there. Um, but it's the strong axis, so we have a stronger member in reality, but that's that's how you design uh, for bending for studs. We're not designing for bending for studs, but I just wanted to give you a little background on why the, both of those things are there. The lower the values you use, the weaker your stud will be, and they're asking for the weakest possible stud because um, they're asking what's the maximum it could hold, which means the maximum is only as much as it can possibly hold before it fails. So you have to find the lowest number. Hopefully that doesn't sound like a double negative. So we're going to use 0 0.33. And all we have to do now is change FC into FC prime. And to do that, you just multiply FC by all of your adjustment factors. I didn't plug in the 1.0s because that's just redundant. And that gets us the following, 820 PSI. And you're like, oh, that's my answer, moving on. Well. Remember, the units are in PSI, and I always like to circle or highlight what the final solution is looking for for a unit. They're looking for pounds. So you gotta convert that stress into um, a load, a demand. To do that for compression, it's just FC prime times the area, the gross area of your cross section. Two by four is actually one and a half inches by three and a half inches, which gets you a gross cross-sectional area of, what the hell does that get you? 1.5 times 3.5, 5.25 inches squared. Total random side note, if you really don't wanna risk that equation or if you're not sure, because remember, two by eights from there up, um, it's not just a half inch shaved off, it's three quarters of an inch. So it's a two by eights actually one and a half by seven and a quarter. So in case you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure what's the actual size. In the NDS, in chapter, beginning of chapter three, it has design properties and all of that stuff is tabulated if you didn't want to calculate yourself and risk it. So there you go. And it's just this number times this number, pounds per square inch times square inches just gets you pounds, which gets you 4,303 pounds. ASD, no load combos, nothing like that. I'm gonna say option D. Now, before you go, one more bit of advice. Some things to note, if I zoom in a little bit here. C sub D is 1.6, although that doesn't apply to this problem. 1.6 means that this is a short-term load duration. So under a wind or seismic event, just something to know. Quiz yourself, why is that uh, adjustment factor like that. We talked about, because it actually, although C sub D wasn't really important to figure out, having the knowledge of what these adjustment factors do and mean was important for C sub P. Although they asked for the maximum vertical load, it's all about understanding and being confident about what information you need to use that they provide you. Because most often you do not need to use everything that they give. Matter of fact, that's actually what they want to make sure you understand is that you don't have to use everything. In this case, they gave you extra information. They gave you spacing of the studs, not required. 
They gave you the height of the stud, not required. They could, how could they flip that and make it where I had to use that? Well, they could have given you a load along the top of the wall. You know, if we're looking at the wall elevation this way, and they gave you a line load of, you know, 200 PLF, and then, you know, your studs could have been 16 inches on center, which then you would have had to derive a force and they might say, what's the DCR for that stud? And you found that, oh, there was 2000 pounds that you found per stud and I don't know. And then you had to drive the capacity and found it was 2000 over 4,300 and that got you a DCR and that got you an answer. So realize that there's different ways that they could mix up the same problem when you're actually taking the test. Good luck on your continued studies. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Peace. Just bitch slap my microphone. Like, geez, what did it do? What did it do?